Welcome to the Hair Nuts Podcast. I am your host, Maxine Green, owner and master stylist at Curly Dimension Salon. This podcast was created to educate and motivate you on how to properly care for your natural curly hair. Every week, a new episode will drop. So grab a notepad and pen, pull up a chair, and let's have a chat. Let's get into today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome into the Hair Notes podcast. On today's episode, this is a very special episode. I wanted you guys to... um, get to know a little bit about Dr. Ose Tutu, who is simply amazing. Today's conversation we want to talk about, we're going to talk to you about hair loss and the alarming number of women in our community that is experiencing hair loss. And so I wanted to have this conversation with none other than the expert within this field. Dr. Ose Tutu is a board certified dermatologist, her um, care and her time and efforts to help women understand why they're losing their hair and what they need to do in order to care for their hair. Um, So I am so excited to sit down and have this conversation with Dr. Ose Tutu. Welcome y'all. So I'm just so excited. I'm like, I'm like a little kid, right? (laughs) Welcome Dr. Ose Tutu to the Hair Notes podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. So I look forward to Absolutely. Conference. Absolutely. So I wanted to talk to you. There's an alarming number of women in our, in particular in our community that is losing their hair at such an exponential rate. And I wanted to get your opinion and your opinion on why do you think that is? And what are some of the things that they can do to either slow the process down or to prevent it altogether? Well, I mean, you know, there, the main cause of alopecia that is um, increasing in exponential rate is called central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. Mm-hmm. There are some studies that um, report that Black women, up to 50% of Black women, experience hair loss in some form or fashion. And again, the most common one that we're seeing that's in, in the inflammatory scarring category is the CCCA. So I think that there are several factors that are, you know, that can be included into why we're recognizing it more. Number one, people are actually going to the dermatologist. So there's a sort of a diagnosis bias. Um, you know, doctors are recognizing it more. Um, and it may be that the condition is just on the rise in combination with some of the things that we're doing to our hair as far as far as, uh, as, far as grooming and styling practices are concerned. Gotcha. Now, would you then say, or would have in your, in your practice, would you then say that you've seen, based on everything you've just said, would you say that our desire, our desire, or what we've been doing to our hair in the past, because a lot of us, in particular myself, we started relaxing at a very young age, right? Because our mom and dads or our parents didn't know what to do with our hair, right? So we started the process of relaxing at a very young age. Would you say that has a trigger for it or are what we're using in terms of hair application and so forth? Do you, do you think that has some basis on that hair loss? I think the most important thing to do is just define what hair loss is and sort of break it down into the categories, right? Because it's not all about just blaming ourselves because there are actually some or issues that happen on the scalp that you have nothing to do with, right? They just kind of happen. Some of them are autoimmune. Some of them are due to things that happen within in the body. So when we break down hair loss, you break it down into scarring and non-scarring. Right. So non scarring, um, there may or may not be inflammation, but the follicle is still there. It can be regenerated. You can still grow hair. So examples of those would be something called telogen effluvium or sort of postpartum shedding. Um, Some of the hair loss that you may get, you know, post like chemotherapy treatment, um, you know, a condition called alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune condition. And if you treat it, the hair can grow back, even though you get um, circular ball patches, even without treatment many of those patients will grow the hair back on its own. So scarring alopecia involves some type of permanent damage to the hair follicle. And that might be primary, meaning the hair follicle is a primary target of this sort of death, um, mainly via inflammation. And then you can have secondary scarring alopecia be, via things like burns or scars and things like that. So the ones that we tend to see in the office most commonly in women of African descent are these inflammatory primary scarring alopecias. 
And when you break those down, you see things like CCCA, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. You see things like lichen planus pilaris. And if we break it down even further in that category, we break it down in terms of the cell type that is a, a, involved in the inflammation. So we bring it down, break it down into lymphocytes, which is a particularly immune cell that we see affecting that follicle, neutrophilic, which is another type of cell, tel, um, cell type, mixed and then nonspecific. So um, depending on the type of alopecia, anything can make it worse. And you can say that for any disease entity, right? You have your disease entity that might be genetically inherited or you might have spontaneously gotten it. And then you have all of these environmental influences that may affect it for the better or for the worse. And in uh, the case of CCCA, we found that in 2019, a study was published showing that there is indeed a genetic predisposition to it. Okay, so there's that, right? So a lot of times patients come in and they will say, okay, well, my mom has it, my aunt has it, my cousin has it. Add on top of that issues that we have in terms of grooming and styling our hair, because we can also have something called traction alopecia, which is caused by tension. And it's not just black women. Anybody who pillows their hair on a regular basis, whether it be sumo wrestlers, whether it be ballerinas, black, white, or otherwise, they can get it also. So I don't think that you can say, oh, it's just, you know, black women that, you know, are, are doing these grooming practices, but they can exacerbate these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are very creative people and you know, we come up with all of these different ways um, to style and groom our hair, and it's amazing and beautiful. But sometimes these things can be um, harmful. Uh, and, you know, one of the issues potentially is that when we feel this harm or see this harm, whether we be the stylist or the client, right? Because I'm sure patients, uh, uh, clients will come to you and say, I don't really care what happens, even if you tell them that this is not a safe thing to do, maybe you say, don't dye your hair, don't do this, maybe let's give it a break. They're like, well, I have an event to go to and I have to get this done, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it be the stylist or the client, we may engage in behaviors that we know may be harmful. Add into that the fact that you have an underlying scalp disease. Add into that, you may have an undiagnosed systemic issue that may be adding to your hair loss. Add on to that, you may have some stress involved in your life. So there are multiple factors that are involved in any one particular person manifesting uh, disease and, and manifesting a particular type of severity of their disease as well. Wow, yeah, I, I completely agree. So from a stylist perspective, as a stylist behind the chair in the salon, and I am seeing so many women who are in the beginning process of the retraction alopecia, what would you then advise for the stylist? Have the dialogue with the clients, right? On care, on hair care, proper hair care. Would you then recommend or would you then offer to a stylist to talk to the client about diet? Since it's hereditary and a lot of it is underlying diseases and there's so many factors that can trigger or alter something that's already there lying dormant, right? So it's now coming to the surface. What would you then advise a stylist? How would you then, um, how should a stylist approach a new client, right? That's now experiencing this because since I hear is such a big part of who we are, right? How would you? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, rec stylists need to recognize their power, right? In helping women who have hair loss. Um, you know, a lot of times you are the first responders, right? Because you're the ones who are seeing the entirety of the head, whether, whether it be through the washing process or the styling process. So you're very important. And it's not only that I'm saying that there have been actual studies that have been published showing the importance of barbers and stylists in terms of disseminating health information. So, you know, kudos to you guys. So it's important to use it as an opportunity to help the client. So the first thing is to identify that something is wrong, right? If you have a client that you've been seeing for a long time, you know, paying attention to what you guys always do, paying attention to their hair, the quality of their hair, how much hair is falling out when you wash it, how much hair is falling out when you brush it, um, style it, things of that nature. Um, for a new client, going through their hair, as you always do through doing the washing or the styling process, or if you do some sort of a consultation, um, and just sort of really keeping your eye on alert, understanding that there is an epidemic of hair loss in women of African descent. And it's not just the scalp, right? What about the actual quality of the hair, right? Mm. Because the quality of the hair being, um, you know, less than optimal can be a sign that something else on the scalp or actually internally is going on. So it's not just you looking for bald spots, looking for the quality of the hair. 
Okay, fine. You have identified that. Okay. Take pictures while the person is there. Show them the severity of what you are seeing, mm. even compared to different parts of the hair. So if you say, okay, well, this part of your hair is really good, but oh my gosh, look at this part. Mm. Look at, look at it in the picture. Cause sometimes people don't see, look at how your hair is breaking on this side and in the back, like your hair is super healthy. Look at how your parts are on this side, really small. And on this part, so your parts are really wide. Look at this ball spot, take pictures with their phone and your phone and show it to them. Right. right? You cannot make a diagnosis because you are not a trained physician. And really, physicians are the only ones who can make diagnoses. If you recognize that they have an issue, I would suggest you probably need to go see a dermatologist. And you are in, you're in, where are you? You're in Brooklyn? You're in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, yeah. So there are multiple doctors. Let's just take New York, for instance. Amazing doctors um, who, dermatologists who not only are really well versed in hair loss. So you have a lot of people to choose from, right? So you can send them to the various doctors in New York, who are dermatologists in New York who treat hair loss and just regular dermatologists, not necessarily that it's their focus. And I'll, and I'll use this opportunity to say that dermatologists are trained to treat hair, skin and nails. Now, some of us like hair a little bit more, so we may be subspecialized in that. Just like some of us like laser a little bit more. So we, you know, we, we do that more in our office, but most derms, are trained to do hair, skin, and nails. Um, and in New York, there are actually a lot of people who subspecialize uh, and have a special interest in hair loss. So you're very lucky. So recommend them to go to the multiple dermatologists in New York who, um, who may be able to help and treat them. Because early diagnosis, I'm telling you, once we get our, the patients in our office early, we can do a lot more for them. That's so good. That's so good. Well, just an FYI, you're my go-to derm. So that's who I recommend all of my clients to attend yeah. because mm -hmm. your work speaks for itself. Right. And you, I keep hearing the rapport from the clients who've gone to see you, you know, I share, you and I have shared patients. And sure. so they have, sing praises they sing your praises so you're my go-to and I certainly do appreciate your time um for that and your just your passion behind this right to help women understand what to do and and when they see an issue address it immediately and not wait and I think for so many of us and to your point you are so right it's not only in our within our community it's across the board right um, but in particular, we, I can only speak for our community because that's who I deal with on a on daily basis as a stylist in their salon. What I, what I want to say or what, I wanted, what I'm trying to understand or what I would love for stylists to take away and our clients to take away from this interview is start the process early. Know that there's an issue. Start the process early. But don't feel embarrassed because so many women are embarrassed to even seek the advice of a derm, right? They're so scared to find out. It's just, in particular, when it comes to our health, we are the last ones to go seek advice from a doctor. We are the last ones to get our health in order. Hair is a big part of who we are. It's a big part of our identity. It's the first thing the human eye gravitate to, right? So I wanna encourage women to really own that and walk into that, right? And just if this is the first thing the human eye gravitate to, take care of it. I always tell the clients, hair is just an, a direct extension of your face. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that hair, not a direct extension of your face, but of your health in general, right? We mm -hmm. use the hair, skin, and nails often as um, signs and signals that there might be something else going on in the body, right? Um, and so it's important to recognize when something is awry and, and address it, right? You know, if, if your hair is shedding, sometimes, particularly, you know, I'll give you an example with COVID, right? Some people come to me and they're like, oh, my hair is shedding so badly. We do labs on them. We do tests on them, including um, sometimes COVID testing. And the only sign that they had COVID was the fact that their hair was shedding. Wow. Right? Or the only sign that their scalp is itchy um, is that they have, they have lupus underlying or they have an anemia underlying. Um, so the hair can tell us that something else is going wrong. Wow. So yes, of the face, but more so of the body. So 
when patients come in, I use it as an opportunity to um, check everything, number one, mm -hmm. and then also remind them like, now you're going on this sort of journey to help your hair. Use it as an opportunity, as a journey to help the rest of your body. The hair is an extension of the follicle, which is embedded deep into the, the, the fatty tissue, which gets blood vessels from the heart, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. if you have an issue with your cardiovascular system, if you have a history of diabetes, if you have an anemia, if you're not feeding your body the proper nutrients, then your hair will not be optimized because it's only seeing what you give it. Wow, that's so amazing. So interest, So essentially your hair is telling the picture of what is going on underlying, underlying it, it issue. Can, absolutely. You, now you can have a, a scalp only issue, but that can be in addition to or separate from a systemic yeah. issue that you're having. Absolutely. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So how do you feel about the recommendation of, of vitamins, right? I know so many of us, we lack, we're vitamin D deficient. And that's simply because we're not getting the essential vitamin D or the necessary vitamin D that we all need. Right. And I know vitamin D plays such a major role in our body, in, in our body's functionality. Right. So what do you, how do you speak to that client who is now vitamin D deficient, who to your point is anemic or low in some form of iron or so forth? How do you speak to that client or when a client is sitting in your chair and she's now after all of your tests, she's now deficient. How do you then encourage her to start the process or increase your levels of vitamin Ds and, and any kind of vitamin in particular? So, you know, any one um, treatment is, I use it as a tool, right? Mm -hmm. So I break, I break treatments down into what I can do in the office for you, okay. right? Which is medicine, which is a part of the treatment right? The other part of the treatment is what you do, what we fix systemically, okay? If, if indeed we find a problem. The other part or tool that we can use to manage you is what you do for yourself as far as taking the best care of yourself that you can. Managing stress, eating well. The other part of the treatment is how you groom yourself, whether that be with or without a stylist. So if we take this part of the treatment and we find that you are deficient in a particular area. Number one, eat the rainbow, eat a well-balanced diet that is heavy on the plants, right? Consume more water. If you find a particular deficiency, then you want to fix that deficiency, whether I send you back to the primary doctor or I'm able to fix it myself. If there is a deficiency, particularly in iron, you know, your hair, is going to lag behind. There's no point in my medications if you are severely deficient in iron or other nutrients. Right. So you have to fix those things so that the medication can work better. If you are pulling and breaking your hair and you know doing things that completely irritate your scalp, my medications are not going to work as well. So everything has to be put together so that your hair follicles can be optimized and that your hair shaft and your strands can also be optimized as well. Um, so it's, you know, eat well and then, you know, fix whatever deficiency there are. Now, there are a number of supplements that have been shown in some studies to provide a good nutrient environment for the follicle and help to stabilize the hair cycle and maybe keep the hairs in the growth phase or the antigen phase for a little while longer. And, um, you know, those supplements include things like Nutrafol or Viviscal, and there are a couple other ones in the office that I, that I might recommend. So I do think that nutrients uh, um, and supplementations, or we call them nutraceuticals, uh, and also fixing underlying issues is a vital, vitally important part of the, any treatment regimen. That's so important. I love that. I love that. I think that so many of us in, in, in particular in our community, when I see um, clients who they just, we forget about ourselves, right? Yeah, We're the sure. last yeah. on the totem pole. We think we take care of everyone else and we forget about ourselves. Everyone else needs to be taken care of. Everyone else is, you know, good and well, but then we forsake ourselves. And that's when the issue starts to arise. And that's when we say, oh, I got to start taking care of myself more. 
But I, I, I believe what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is we got to start the process first, put ourselves first, because we're no, we're no good to anybody if we don't take care of ourselves, right? Yeah. And I love that. I just, I love that. I want to ask you about scalp um, micropigmentation, mm -hmm. right? I know it's something that it's permanent. It's somewhat, it's something, it's somewhat similar to microblading, right? Um, it gives you a woman who is already experiencing severe alopecia, the natural of a, the natural look of a hairline. How do you feel about this particular treatment? And would you recommend it for women who are experiencing a severe alopecia? Yeah, so um, scalp micropigmentation is the use of an organic pigment um, that's put at the, what we call the epidermal dermal layer, um, or dermal epidermal layer. So it's the junction between the superficial part of the skin and the, the deeper part of the skin. Um, and um, I recommend it all the time. And it's meant to simulate the look of either a shaved head follicles. And when you get up close, you can see that it's, it's pigment, but from far away, it gives you camouflage. Mm -hmm. It can be in patients with varying types of alopecia. It doesn't have to be necessarily severe alopecia. And it's a type of a camouflage technique. I used to do it in, my, in the office myself, but due to time constraints, I um, don't do it as much, but we'll be reinstituting it back, um, hopefully in the summertime. I'm gonna be training somebody to do it in the office. It can be an extremely useful tool uh, and patients who, as you stated previously, have severe alopecia, who don't necessarily want to wear wigs and want to have the freedom of wearing their hair out, um, you know, can cover the areas of the scalp that kind of look really smooth um, and sometimes even dark from all the inflammatory issues that happen on the scalp. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're dealing with in patients who have scarring alopecia, sometimes the pigment may sit a little bit differently. Uh, you have to be really careful about, about, about the practitioner that you go to wow. and what it looks like, uh, because sometimes it can look, um, for lack of a better word, uh, it, it, it can look not optimal. Uh, let's just say that the pigment can be very irregular. It can be, the dots can be very big. So you want to always start out by um, getting pictures and, and sort of getting the look that you want finding the look that you want and seeing that if you can find a, a hair um, scalp micropigmentation uh, technician who can give you that look, always start a little bit lighter and then you can always add as time goes on, making sure that the dots are really small. There are lots of practitioners in the city uh, who, who do I think a pretty good job that I do refer people to, but I always give them parameters as far as like what it should look like after talking to the client. And you have to be very careful about putting it in areas where it's really totally bald and then you have hair right beyond the area because it can look a little funny. Uh, so there is an aesthetic eye that you have to have when you are doing the scalp micropigmentation. That's why you are the board certified dermatologist and that's why you're the expert in this area. That's why we come to you. Um, I think that's so interesting. And when I read about this, I, I, I thought to myself, wow, it's an option. Right, because so many women, the self-esteem, I can see their shoulders just kind of like dropping because they don't feel confident in themselves. So this is just another service that can be offered to them to give them that level of confidence that they're looking for, right? So I love that. I love, I absolutely love that. So I wanna to talk to you about how do you feel about clients who are experiencing some shedding, some breakage, they have enough hair. You can tell they have a head full of hair, but when you part, they have the breakage and they're experiencing that like fine strands, in particular in the hair, the halo area, right? So in the parietal ridge, right in the crown area, I see a lot of clients um, experiencing hair loss within that area. How would you then advise that client to start her regimen now how would you say what what's the next step for her so um yeah i mean i think the crown area can show a, a lot of different conditions um whether it be female pattern hair loss or in particular this central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia or ccca and um again i would take a, an image and show it to them um let them see what's going on 
and remind them that uh, clients who don't necessarily catch it early can progress. And if they wait for too long a period of time, it may get to a point where it's very difficult to um, clinically reverse some of the things that we're seeing. You yeah. can even pull up um, some images on my website. They're in their um, descriptions okay. of various diseases. Mm -hmm. um, we're revamping a, a website that we have called Docs for Hair um, mm -hmm. that lists you know, dermatologists across the country and the world who focus in on particularly and who specialize in hair loss. There's information on that website as well. So pull up a website and say, hey, it looks maybe like this is going on with you. You should definitely see a dermatologist because what's written about this says that if you wait too long, it can get worse. And when it gets worse, there's not really a lot that the doctors can do to, to help you if it gets severe enough. So just encourage them to, to, to go in. Yeah. That's so good. I love it. How important is it to be mindful of your shampoos and conditioners? How important is that, that start and process? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there are lots of shampoos and, and conditioners that depending on the type of scalp issue that you have can create some irritation, dryness, and breakage. You know, some of these conditions cause various levels of hair fragility. Um, they already, you know, we should know that our hair um, is not coated evenly with the natural oils that tend to coat the scalp, right? As you can imagine, the hair is coming out of the scalp. It comes out in its wavy or coily texture mm -hmm. versus a straight hair where if you, you know, the oil producing gland underneath the, the scalp is kind of sitting next to the follicle. And as the hair, uh, the hair shaft is rising above, the, the oil producing gland is kind of coating it evenly. When the hair is coiled, it coats it maybe here and on this part, you know, not evenly, which is why our hair tends to be a little bit drier. Right. You know, and if you add on top of that, some sort of inflammatory scalp condition that's reducing the function of the oil producing gland, you're going to have a very, you know, you're going to have less oil on, on the hair. And then sometimes, again, that condition can produce a hair shaft that's just not functioning properly. So the hair tends to be really dry and brittle. You may have an underlying thyroid problem or something that, again, yeah. compounds that issue. And so using the right shampoo and conditioner is going to be vitally important. Remember I said grooming is part of the treatment. Yes, right? absolutely. So, I love that you said that. Yeah, yeah. So you want to find a good, in conjunction with your stylist, or if you know you can't necessarily afford to go to the stylist, you know, find a good non-sulfated, you know, shampoo, um, and then a really good deep conditioner, particularly if you have curly, curly hair, trying to do deep conditioners on your hair at least once a week. And cleansing that scalp. We got to make sure that you cleanse the scalp. We tend to wait a really long time before we wash our hair. And it's important to cleanse the scalp. There are all types of bacteria, you know, um, yeast that live on the, the, on the scalp and just debris, environmental pollutants, you know, our skin cells shedding themselves. And they all need to be cleared on a regular basis so that your function, your follicles can function optimally. I am so glad you said that. I am so glad you said that. I've been singing, I, I feel like a broken record when I speak to yeah. the clients of the importance of not keeping the same hairstyle for too long and making sure that your scalp is cleansed periodically. In particular, to your point earlier, during COVID, I made a video and I put it into in my private group. And I said, listen, guys, I need you to wash your hair. You can't yeah. get to the salon, but you guys need to make sure your scalp is clean. Do not wait. At that point, we were closed for three months, but do not wait until the final hour or when you can come back in because at that point, you're, you're going to experience so many issues, right? And one of those issues is hair loss because your hair is now tangled and matted together. So I'm so glad you mentioned that, the importance of really maintaining your scalp because that's going to really, a healthy scalp really helps you get to the place that you're desired, right? I want to talk about high blood pressure medication. I've noticed that so many women are on high blood pressure medication, whether it's a low dose or a very high dose, but it's triggering hair loss within, that's one of the side effects from this particular medication. Is there something that they can do to counter that? Is there something they can take? 
or what can they say to, or what, how can they then have a, a conversation with their doctor to, Hey, listen, I, I want to turn this down or I want to reduce the amount or what do I need to do to get me not to have to take this or to essentially come off of it altogether. And I know part of it is stress, but I want to hear what you think about. I, mean, I think, you know, high blood pressure is caused by, you know, different issues, whether again, it be, again, you take one issue and then you add the multitude of things that can influence it, right? You have your genetic predisposition for hypertension, and then you have a, a you know, a numerous amount of environmental influences, you know, including stress, including diet, things like that. So if they want to get off of blood pressure medication, they can talk to their, their physician and their dietitian and their nutritionist about what ways that they can make lifestyle modifications to get themselves off of it, if that is a possibility. There are various medications and issues in your life that can cause hair shedding. So you need to work with the dermatologist and your primary doctor to identify that it's actually that medication that is causing it because it could be true, true and unrelated, right? There can be something happening at the same time in your life that might be doing it. It might be another um, issue that you're having in, in, you know, that might be causing the hair loss. So really identifying the problem is important and not necessarily just blaming a particular medication. Um, if you do identify that there is a medication that's causing your, your hair loss, whether it be a blood pressure medication, depending on the type of problem that you have. Um, some of the medications that we use in dermatology to help to stimulate growth um, or balance out the hormones on the scalp are actually old blood pressure medications. So you can potentially substitute the ones that we use to help hair loss um, and also that also treat blood pressure for the ones that you're taking. Uh, but the most important thing to do is see if you can make lifestyle modifications to either reduce the amount um, or come off of them completely. And then again, work with your doctor and your dermatologist to see how they can be adjusted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many, um, there's so many variables, right? And there's so many right. things that you see daily um, as a stylist. So one of the things that you talked about earlier, and I wanted to go back there for a moment, if we can, and you talked about the way the hair is grown out of the scalp. Because, you know, it's not, if it's straight, it's getting coated with the oil. But if your hair is curly and then textured, you're still not getting so much of that moisture that you need, you desire, right? So, so often I have a conversation with clients about the importance of maintaining a good um, hair regimen, right? And making sure that your hair is hydrated. So clients will oftentimes get a big chop or, or cut off all their hair, but then that's it. There's nothing else. They just kind of like, let it be in their mind, right? They're so thinking, well, now that I can big chop and so, or I can cut off all my hair or I can transition, but I don't have to do anything. I don't have to put in any work. As a dermatologist, what would you say to that client who simply just, their lack of understanding is like, I don't really, I guess what I really want to say is their concept of what their hair should look and feel like is completely distorted and they feel now that I'm curly or not that I'm big chop I can just do wash it goes or I can just simply allow my hair to be this way what do you say to that client well, I, I think everything on the human body needs to be maintained right you wouldn't not wash your face or not brush your teeth or not bathe or not moisturize your skin. And I mean, the list goes on, right? You know, clean your ears. You know, if you leave all of those things for too long, things happen that you don't desire. And the same can be said about the hair. It requires maintenance. Um, and some people require more maintenance than others, depending on their type of hair. Um, so it's just something that we need to accept. Um, and so whether your hair is short or long, uh, the hair needs to be hydrated or moisturized, whatever, you know, wh whichever way you want to, to, you know, whatever way you want to call it, um, you know, you need to cleanse your scalp, you need to condition the hair, because once you cleanse it, you know, it, it, it gets dry. So you need to replenish whatever you took out in the, in the washing process with a deep, with a conditioner. And then after that, if you just leave water on your hair, it evaporates and it becomes dry. Mm -hmm. So there are various products on the market that help to smooth the cuticle down on the hair. 
um, and that help to maintain the water um, in the hair, right? Because the softest and the most malleable and the most manageable for most people that your hair feels like is when it's immersed in water. Mm-hmm. And so the goal is always to try to maintain that during the week, right? So that your hair feels moisturized. And so, you know, you use whatever product that you come up with, whether it be something that you found on your own or in conjunction with your stylist to keep your hair in that phase where it feels the softest and, and most malleable, meaning that it has some water molecules attached to it. Yeah. And the hair just has to be maintained. And so if you don't, you know, create a maintenance regimen regimen for your hair, then you just get more breakage, you get dryness. And if that's what you choose, then, you know, that's what you choose. All right, you guys, you heard it here. I am not crazy. I've been saying this, I've been preaching this. And now I have someone who can verify. Um, So I want to talk to you about, it's so good. I'm, I so love, I love it. So I want to talk to you about your treatments in your, um, in your practice. So a new client coming into you as a new patient or a new patient, not a new client, a new patient coming into you, what does her treatment look like? And I know that you would factor it based on who she is and where she is in that, in her, in her journey. Right. So walk us through what does the normal regimen or what does the normal um, timeline look for a patient coming into you for treatment? So I go back to my, you know, basic toolboxes, right, that I use, um, you know, whether it be my medications, um, looking at your systemic issues, um, you know, your lifestyle, and then also grooming habits, right? And so one can pull from all of those things. Now, I don't think that there's a typical anything for my patients because some people are like, I am not using any of your medications, (laughs) which, you know, (laughs) I I think of myself as an educator, right? So it's my job, at least the way that I feel, to give you a diagnosis, let you know what is going on with you, do some some tests, right? Start some investigations, maybe schedule you for a biopsy, you know, check some blood work on you, um, find out what's going on, give you the big picture about what's going on with you, what the potential prognosis could be on somebody with the stage or condition that you have, the condition and the stage of the condition that you have, and then tell you what we typically do to manage it. Mm-hmm. I'm not the one that's going to be home taking the medication. Okay. I'm not the one that's going to be home, you know, um, I'm not the one who has to present in the world like I have recommended for you to do as far as grooming and styling, right? So you have to do the things that make you comfortable with the understanding that if you don't do A, B, C, and D, that these things may happen. And the things that may happen may be irreversible, right? And so if you decide that you're not going to use my medication and you want to take an alternative, right? That's fine. I I do not think that we in medicine have the answers for every single thing. We don't, right? If we did, then, you know, I'd have the cure for CCCA. I know I don't have the cure for CCCA. We're managing it the best that way we that we can based on the information that we have. But that is what all of medicine is about, right? So if you have found an alternative way to treat yourself and maybe you came to me just for information because people just come for that, right? They're like, oh no, I'm just going to stick with my natural treatments. Okay. Well, I've seen people go down this path before and sometimes at least the ones who come end up coming back to me, and that may just be a bias, right? Because it didn't work out for them. And then, and then they came back. It doesn't necessarily work out. And now I do think that there are some natural things that tend to work for, for people, but that's a different story for, for another day. Um, but if we're talking about the medicinal, um, toolbox, it's some sort of anti-inflammatory, whether it be topical injection or oral, um, something to help to keep the hairs in the growth phase for a long period of time. And that's usually some sort of minoxidil, whether it be oral or topical, whether it be over the counter or something that we prescribe for you. Um, And some sort of nutraceutical um, or supplement that we use as well. So those are the three main categories of medicines that we use. Um, and then there are so many different types of medicines that we use in each category. Awesome. And I know that some clients are, I know there, I'm going to get tons of DMs, tons of info or questions asked. 
where can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? So I'm going to put all that information in the show notes, but I wanted, I wanted people to get an opportunity to really um, hear it from the horse's mouth, right? Because so many people or so many women um, are always asking, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin. I think to your point earlier, the first thing is to seek advice, right? The first sure. thing to certainly, if you see an issue, if you experience in some sense of hair loss or some sense of shed in, definitely reach out to a derm, definitely reach out to a professional. You know, you don't want to self-diagnose or you, you know, as hairdressers, we're not, we're not medical practitioners to your point. We certainly don't want to be, but you know, I know a lot of us try to be, we, we, you know, we often act like we are, but we're not. Um, So seeking the advice of a professional is super important in this journey, right? I know um, natural hair is such a big thing. It's such a big, it's a, it's not going anywhere, right? And it's only getting larger and it's only getting bigger. And so for me, this was so important to have this conversation because I have, just working with women who I see that how the effects of this is having on their self-esteem, sure. you know, and I, it's, it's just a, a, a it's just been re- really close to my heart. And I've seen women just tears, you know, yeah. they're afraid to be seen. They're afraid to go out, you know, we're social. And to your point, we're super creative and, you know, we can do and add so many th- different um, hairstyles to look and feel good about ourselves but when our hair is not the way we are used to yeah or you know what I mean yeah it 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 affects us I think um you know it's it's great if people come and see me but I care more about people just getting seen in general right um different offices have different wait times um and you know I've created so many different um directories and opportunities for people to have points of care. So, you know, if they're looking for a black dermatologist, they can go on blackdermdirectory.com. If they're looking for a dermatologist who, you know, focuses on hair loss, they can go to um, Docs for Hair. If you just want a dermatologist in general, um, they can go to the American Academy of Dermatology um, and go to their find a doctor page. So there are multiple resources for people to find a dermatologist. They don't just have to come to me. I like to share. I think, you know, um, continuity of care is really important. I have people coming to me from, you know, all across the country. And I'm like, there's a perfectly amazing dermatologist right next to you, but they, they don't know, right? right. And so um, it's a burden for me to, you know, provide people with the, with the information so that they have less obstacles for them, you know, getting, getting taken care of because the relationship with a dermatologist when you have hair loss is a long one, right? Because treating hair loss is not like I give you medication and the hair comes back right away. No, I'm we're talking about months to years. You know, I've had patients who I've been seeing for 10 years, right? Um, so it's not just a a one-time thing because depending on your, your, the, the cause of your hair loss, you need to do something and then you need to do, maintain that something over time. Um, so it's really, really important that they find somebody who they, you know, that they gel with and people move all across the country, right? They may not just be in Brooklyn. They may move to another state. So there are multiple resources for people to find somebody close to them. I love that. I love that you are so open to community. You've created such a directory of community. I love that. And I think that's what speaks to who you are. And it also speaks to your reputation. And that's why so many, so many people want to reach out to you. So kudos to you for that, right? To reach across the table and and extending. I love, 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 love that, right? Um, After all, you're one person. You just can't service everybody, right? Um, There are lots of great, there are lots of great germs out there. That's, you know, and I think in doing some of these projects, I, you know, often will beam with pride when I'm doing the social media. It's like the germs are, they're bad. They are doing some amazing things. Yeah. Really, they're doing amazing things. Yeah. So people should rest assured. And they're people who are super passionate about hair loss and they're doing lots of research. It's not just what they're doing in their clinic, but they are, you know, sort of putting their money where their mouth is, you know, going and doing the research, publishing papers and helping us find a lot more about these conditions. And not just like for hair loss stuff, but for multiple issues in dermatology. So it's, it's wonderful. I love that. 
I love that. I um, wanted to ask you about the gluten. The what? Gluten, like a gluten allergy. Let's say there's a patient that has a gluten allergy. Do you think that that would have some type of adverse effect on her hair? You know, I don't know if there's any been any specific study, particularly on, you know, CCCA. Um, there hasn't been. Um, and as far as like gluten allergy is concerned and, and that type of hair loss, mm -hmm. I think that you have to pay attention to your body, right? And so if you find that something is bothering you, you can start to keep a diary, right? What happens over a few months? Um, what I tell patients is get a, a, a Ziploc bag, a small one, start to date it. And then every week, you know, you have to do it the same in the same time frame. If you wash your hair every week, wash it every week, look at if it's a shedding issue, you know, look and see how much hair is shed, um, put it in the bag, and then, you know, take away a particular thing or add a particular thing. You have to watch it over months and see what happens, right? Because, you know, it, there might be something that you're doing, whether your stress level is super high, whether, you know, you have a seasonal change because there is seasonal shedding, whether it's gluten or, or any other thing, um, and see how that, that affects your body. Um, but there hasn't been a particular uh, study with respect to that. I love that. Thank you so much. I really love that. Taking a Ziploc bag and really monitoring your hair loss sure. shedding. It's sure. Really make you be more aware. Exactly. And Keep a diary aware. too, right? Yeah. When you eat a gluten containing food or anything that happens in your life, when you have significant stress, how does your scalp feel? How does this feel? Or how does it affect your skin? Keep a diary, look at it over a period of a few months, and then you can, you know, bring that to the dermatologist. You guys can go over together and see if you can come up with something. Awesome. I love it. I really do love it. It's, it, it's important that you be mindful, right? And you pay attention, pay close attention. So I know that there's a lot of stylists who are journeying into the world of tracheology. And they are, and I think it's so amazing. I, I, I'm saying kudos to them. I don't have the time to take the class. I, you know, because it really helps, but I'm looking into it. But besides that, I know there's so many of us are journeying into that, that particular area. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it would help? Do you think it would kind of push us more? I know we're not derms, but do you think that's a great way or a great line of defense for the, the client or the guest who is start or experiencing hair loss? Do you think that'll be a great start? For yeah, them? I mean, I think I think trichology um, is different for different people. They're varying levels of training. It means something very different, let's say in the United States than it does in the, the United Kingdom or um, you know, in, in other parts of Europe. Some of the, the, the trichologists have lots of training, even up to like a PhD level um, where, you know, and some you do like dermatologists are trichologists by, by nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, some people study it more. So it really depends on your level of training, right? Um, a trichologist is not a physician. They do offer amazing treatments for um, uh, hair loss amazing interventions for hair loss that can be very, very helpful depending on the, the, the type of hair loss that you have. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, you, know, you, you can partner, right? Because everybody sort of plays their role and the goal is just to make the person better. That's really it. So yeah. if you identify it and I do this type of treatment and you add that type of treatment, and then the person is better, that's all I really care about, right? As long as we are all on the same page, as long as we are managing the right problem, as long as we have identified the right problem and we're using the right interventions for the right problems, then I say the more the merrier. And you don't necessarily have to be a trichologist to be helpful. You have to be just somebody who cares and pays attention, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're somebody who cares and pays attention, you're gonna be like, hey girl, this don't look right. <laughs> Scalp is looking a little funky. I'm not doing this on you today. <laughs> go see, you know, go see this person. Go see that person. Um, and, and, you know, there are, there, there's a, a, actually a book by Dr. Yolanda Lindsay. Okay. I recommend all stylists get this book. 
It's called Getting to the Root. Um, and Dr. Yolanda Lenzi is, you know, uh, a friend, a colleague, a wonderful human being who is super passionate about hair loss. She actually just got with um, one of my mentors and my heroes in dermatology, Dr. Amy McMichael. They got a $200,000 grant to study hair, Ooh. hair loss issues. Wow. Yes. It's big. It's big. Yeah. It's big. So she is not playing any games. Yeah. And she has an awesome mm -hmm. book. Um, and it goes through all the different types or many different types of hair loss conditions. So even if you have that in your, um, in your, uh, salon, mm -hmm. if you read through it, you'll be able to recognize things, even open the book and say, Hey, I think it looks like this, you know, go on black germ directory, go on docs for hair, go on the American Academy of Dermatology, go on the skin of color society. They also have a directory of doctors, wow. pick a doctor, pick three. You know, go to go go to go see all three of them. See who you vibe with better. See what each of them say, and then stay with somebody. Pick somebody who you're going to stay with. So there are so many resources for us. I love that. I, listen, that was so amazing. That was a whole bar that you just dropped. <laughs> that was a whole bar, right? As the young people would say, that was so good. And I'm actually okay. going to get that book today. <laughs> and keep it in the salon. Because it's important that even when we have in the conversations, we can have real tangible information exactly. Exactly. to back up that conversation. So I love that you share that book. I love that, you know, there are people who are really like yourself, who this is a, a passion that's really near and dear to their heart. It's their life, it works. Their life. money where their mouth is. That's I right. so love this. I'm so grateful for you. And again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to so do this uh, interview. This was so good. I love every minute of it. Oh, I appreciate so you. And I'm glad to share the information. I just hope that your clients will know your heart and know that when you um, like see something on their scalp that you want the best for them. I mean, I know you didn't come into this um, beautiful field and craft. You want to make women feel more beautiful. You want to make, make sure that their, health, their scalp and their hair is healthy. And if you're actually seeing a problem with them that you want them to get the help that they need so that their hair can flourish. And you know, when their hair flourishes, they also flourish as, as well, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know that that's on your heart, absolutely. A hundred percent. You hit yeah. the nail right on the head. A hundred percent. I've always said it's my desire. I don't do any advertisement. You are my walking billboard. So for me, however you choose to wear your hair, I want you to own it, but I want you to be feel confident in it. That's you right. Know? And that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast, because it's so imperative that we have conversations surrounding issues that affects us that's and right. the questions that we all have, including myself, because I'm a, I'm a client first before I'm a stylist. So for me, all of the questions that I'm asking is not only for my guests and my client, but it's for myself. Yourself, right. Do you know what I mean? Because I want to make sure that I'm doing preventative care to start before I get to that place. That's right. right? So this conversation was so necessary and so important. And I know for sure that it's going to help so many women and it's going to resonate with so many women. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I thank you so much. This You're is so awesome. welcome. It's my absolute it's pleasure. So been anytime. awesome. Anytime. Yeah, please tell, please tell our audience where they can find you, how they can get in touch with you, sure. how they can follow you. Sure. All the things. So, so I am in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, where you can find a beef patty around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. My favorite place in the whole world. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I've lived I'm in Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm Brooklyn. Um, and so I'm on 84 Linden Boulevard. There's a lot of construction going on. They're completely changing the area. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, uh, you know, usually you can make an appointment on our website. I will tell you that I do not take insurance. I have not taken insurance probably for the last uh, about year or so, year or more. Um, but again, uh, I'm not the only show in town um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there are multiple dermatologists that people can see if they're not comfortable with that. I want everybody 
I would love for people to come and see me, but that's not the point. The point is yeah. that there are so many resources for you. So please go and seek them yeah. out. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram. I usually post, um, not as frequently as I should. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and although I do a lot of things in Durham, I definitely have Focus my practice on, um, you know, hair loss, hair restoration. I also do hair transplantation as well, which is surgical correction of, of hair loss and um, a lot of acne, hyperpigmentation and a few cosmetic things. So all the other things I used to do in, in Durham before I don't do as much, um, although I do some, but not as much. My, my practice is a little bit more uh, focused now. Um, but yeah, I'm on Instagram. I mainly post about hair loss, even though I do a whole bunch of other things because I need people to see befores and afters. I yes. need people to see that like they can get better. So I sort of dedicated my Instagram page to focusing on hair loss. I also run the Black Derm Directory um, social media page, which I think I probably post more on that, which I sort of highlight um, all the great works of the Black Derm Dermatologists around the world um, and particularly in the United States. And so, you know, if anybody's looking for a, any procedures which they are, you know, trying to decide if it's safe or not, you know, if they want product recommendations, uh, they can sort of go to Black Derm Directory and follow a lot of the, the dermatologists on there. So, you know, we live in a time, thank God, where Black women have a lot of options and it's beautiful. Even in Brooklyn, you know, you have several Black dermatologists, which is awesome. And then of course, if you go across the bridge in Manhattan, you have a lot of options as well. So, um, and you know, my colleagues are wonderful, wonderful people and they're doing such great work. So I, I, I appreciate the company. Yeah, I mean, that's so good. You guys are doing God's work. They're, they're yeah. doing amazing things, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are doing God's work. And so I so appreciate that. I so appreciate that. Man, this was so good. I know we could have yeah. talked for about two hours. I know, about, I know. There's so many other like, things we It's so about. many other things. Yeah, yeah. sure. We could have touched on um, like hair transplant. I know we didn't get to talk yeah. about that. Yeah. But, but And that's a huge right. thing within itself, right? It's a huge yeah. thing. But I just... Um, can I invite you back on? Sure, sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. Man, this was so good. I am like a little little girl like, <laughs> doing black backflips, right? So I want to thank you so much again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this, to be here, to share your expertise, to share your knowledge, and to really help push, help push us to the next level, help absolutely. bring more awareness right to to this i know you are you've authored so many pieces you've lent your time to speaking engagements i know that this you are passionate about in particular our community i know that this is your a work that's near and dear to your heart so i love your work i love the befores and afters i admire you for what you're doing thank you, you. Thought, you're so awesome Thank you. I appreciate you for saying that. Thank Everyone you. Everyone so speaks so highly of you. So thank I mean, you. I'm, I'm one of your biggest fans. I'm a oh, fan. I'm a fan and of thank you. Work. I love your work. I told you I need to, I needed to come in your chair, but you see, this is all gone. I love it. You look absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I, you look absolutely beautiful. I love thank it. You. Thank, but you. thank you so much again. Okay. I so appreciate okay. it. Okay. Have a wonderful and beautiful Have day. Have a blessed week. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, honey.